Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody at home and welcome to another wonderful afternoon out on drive here uh, at Wild Earth TV live from the Sabi Sand on this glorious sunny afternoon. My name is Liam Burrow, our highly skilled camera operator. The man behind the lens is uh, the legendary Panda. Um, we are very excited to be with you here this afternoon, um, hopefully out in search of some more excitement uh, on drive. Um, you'll notice I'm wearing a very, uh, a very striking white Dad vs. Wild t-shirt. You're welcome to uh, pick one of those up for yourself um, from the merchandise section on our website uh, if you'd like. All righty. But I think uh, from Panda and myself, we're probably going to continue uh, on on into the bush this afternoon in the hopes of uh, hopefully sniffing out some wildlife. So let's get cracking. Now we will do our housekeeping as uh, as we continue to bumble. So we like to keep these drives as uh, interactive as possible. Uh, to be great for you to submit your questions to us as we go. Please feel free to uh, send them to us under the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter. Um, you are more than welcome to send them to us as well directly um, under, especially if you are under the age of 18 at um, wild, uh, kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. So that's kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. And as I say, let's make these drives as interactive as possible. Give us the human factor that we are craving out on these drives. Yeah, it's looking like a lovely afternoon. It suddenly got very, very hot. I think we're approaching almost 30 degrees, but um, I don't know, it's looking pretty cloudy. That may not last. Panda and I are going to start making our way into the Simba Mili property now for our afternoon. But uh, while we do that, let's take a look at uh, what the weather's got in store. Welcome to 22 degrees in the low felt of South Africa. Some 400 meters above sea level we find ourselves. Standing in some fine swag available at wildearth.tv. My name is James Hendry. On camera today we have got Gerrit. And we're on our way, hopefully, to see the beautiful Lepides Tlalamba and her two babies. And I thought that we would begin today's drive with this very fine grass plant over here. It is called the Giant Three-Orn. And whenever you say the name of this grass, you need to give it some oomph so as to express the wonder associated with the Giant Three-Orn. And so there it is, the giant three-horn, and it's all gone to seed, as you can see. It's not a very good grazing grass even to begin with, and once it gets to this stage, it's absolutely hopeless for the purposes of consumption, if you happen to be a herbivore. Please ask us any questions that you'd like to. You can do that by sending us tweets to the hashtag Wild Earth. Otherwise, if you are under the age of 18, you can send questions to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. Otherwise, you can go to wildearth.tv and register as an explorer and send us questions that way. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. On we go. Liam very kindly acquiesced to allowing us to go and look at Columba today, which we are very excited about. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. 
But as you know, a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work. Because Wild Earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content. But we want to let you know that we hear you. And to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. We may lose signal as we go down through this dip, but I will keep you posted. If we disappear, we will return shortly. What a blustery afternoon, a strange cold front seems to have blown in. Like I often say, we expect to have three months of really good weather over the course of winter. So when we do have these off days, we feel slightly cheated. Especially those of us who are only here for a few days and have to go back to Johannesburg where it will be foul and cold. I'm going to do one more grass segment, I hope you don't mind. I promise you this is the last grass segment of the um, afternoon. Thank you, Cher. You say you hope I get some time with Thalumbra and the Cubs. I hope I get at least three or four hours with them. I'll be dramatic about this one as well. Behold, Heteropogon con tortoise, spear grass. Now you can see that most of the heteropogon con tortoise has got rid of its seeds, and some of the heteropogon con tortoise still has its seeds. And here are the seeds of heteropogon con tortoise. Now I have showed many of you this before. I have no doubt many other guides have showed you this before. But heteropogon con tortoise is a very clever grass. And over there is the seed of heteropogon con tortoise. And the rest is an awn. And this awn is mighty smart. No, not enough moisture there. You can just see it turning. Maybe you can see it. It starts to turn like this when it gets wet. And so when it rains, what that results in is the seed drilling itself into the ground. Isn't that brilliant? I think that's really clever. I mean, I could have gobbed and spat all over it a bit more effectively than that, but frankly, no one wants to see that, I don't think. On we go. Set across before I go through this dip to Chris. He's 70 kilometers to the west of here, out exploring Pridelands. Good afternoon, everybody. And seems like our weather has improved a little bit. There's a bit of sunshine, which is fantastic. Still quite a bit of wind. Cool, windy weather, not the greatest for animal meeting. So we've decided we're gonna head into these copies. Remember last time we looked at all sorts of funny little things in the copies. Now I've got a suspicion that there might be some changes up there. There might be flowers that are flowering now that we did not see previously. I'm hoping to see those aloes perhaps. Remember those aloes? I was just starting to produce their flowers a couple of weeks ago. If, that, if we're lucky, they might be in bloom. Um, the kudu lilies, all those things, maybe we're lucky. And I'm also going to look for a few reptiles. But anything small, interesting, we're going to go up there and see what we can find. 
So we'll move from copy to copy, spend a bit of time there. All right, so I'm not yet fully rigged and get my binoculars and all my other things. Got the trusty old stick back. So my buffalo stick disappointed me this morning. It couldn't find the buffalo. <laughs> um, but anyway, my name is Chris and with CamOps today is Mpo yet again. Right, Mpo, how shall we approach this hill? I mean, it's quite, <clears throat> quite a dip, dense dip here. But I see a bit of an animal pathway. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. Right, yeah, now I reckon still head into this little valley, go up that way, and we'll check it from there. Hmm. All right, right, I've managed to get my binoculars, I'm gonna get everything strapped, tightened. Let's go over to Liam to see what he's got. myself have found ourselves now on this um, wonderful Simbambili property. Um, yeah, certainly a very, very special area indeed. We're in the hope of uh, potentially tracking down some elephants around here this afternoon. It's um, be a little bit iffy in some of the areas that we're about to pass through. So just bear with us if they have to leave us quite suddenly. Um, it's probably just <laughs> as I as I said that I think I think we're losing our signal. But that's all good. We will uh, find a patch where eventually we can can view nicely. a bit of activity on this property this afternoon. I believe they're constructing some roads, so hopefully that hasn't disturbed too much of the wildlife. But while we figure out what the situation is here in terms of game viewing, let's head over to Steve to see what he's got to show us. Or rather, Jay. All right, we have found all three leopards. They're in here. They have gone across this rather deep and wet gully, and we're just trying to see how to get across. We haven't seen the kills yet. We don't know where they are. And they're somewhere around here, obviously. But all three cats are in this bush to the right-hand side, possibly having a lie down. I wonder if they weren't actually having a drink and now they're going back to their meat. I'm not sure. Anyway, we're going to do a little bit of a drive around. Bear with us as we try and get through here. Gert, what do you think? Do you think we'll get through there? I have a nasty suspicion that would be the end of our drive. 
Yeah, let's not take a chance. There is no recovery vehicle. So we're just going to go a little bit further up before we try and do a crossing. Now, that may well be the end of our drive. This is where all the vehicles were this morning, and I suspect the kill's up this way. Talamba went in there, the Cubs went off slightly off towards the right. And we'll just see how to get across. Looks like a spot over here. Don't want to park the car in a very large hole. Or in, indeed in a small hole. These look like eminently suitable trees in which to place a kill. Do you see a kill in there? I don't think there's a kill up there. No. All right. Let's keep going. My name is Nico Britz. I am originally from Cape Town. I worked in the Eastern Cape for about nine years before I started working at Bushweiss Field Guides in the Low Felt, uh, close to Makalali Private Game Reserve. So I'm hoping that by doing this, this could inspire the younger or newer guides coming into the industry to do the same. Hello everyone, my name is Ruan Groble. I'm from Lion Sands Game Reserve and being nominated for the Safari Guide of the Year came as somewhat of a surprise to me. I was very excited and quite nervous as well in the beginning uh, to tackle this task, but it's, it's, it's quite a prestigious event and it, it means that you are recognized and I'm quite happy to be recognized. It means quite a lot to me. So I'm assuming it's around here that the leopards are. a little bit of time and see if we can't find these cats. While we do that, you go off to Liam and see what he's up to. Wishing James uh, the best of luck on his end. I um, hope he has some success there. Panda and myself are now in these wonderful open clearings on the Simbambili property. Just checking around for any signs of life. As I say, they are constructing roads a little bit further to the east of us. So there's a, a bulldozer moving through, making quite a bit of a racket. So unfortunately, I think it may have uh, kind of disrupted some of the general game a bit. But that's all good, those animals have got to be somewhere. Maybe we can sniff them out. Yeah, never a bad day on a bumble in Africa. What a pleasure. Joshua, some elephants would be excellent this afternoon. Yeah, we occasionally do see them swimming um, at this time of the year, but with temperatures now being a bit lower, and I think exposure to the sun also a little bit lower, um, over the whole they're a bit more reluctant to take the plunge. But stranger things have happened. 
once on a morning game drive in the western sector I saw an elephant bull stood in a dam literally up to his eyeballs and it was like July freezing cold probably two degrees so uh, I guess they are pretty tolerant Pinky, thanks for your question. Um, so I've heard varying reports. I've heard lots of people say 22,000. I've heard 60,000. I've heard 70,000. Um, I think uh, the safest possible answer is tens of thousands of muscles. Um, it is an extremely complex piece of uh, biological engineering. Um, and as we know, it can take an elephant literally years to get the hang of using it. Certainly with coordination that the adults use it. Uh, yeah, it'll take a calf probably a good year to maybe two years to get that dexterity nice. African elephants have a bit of a prehensile tip, so they've got almost two points on it. So arguably an elephant could pick up something as tiny as a single pebble if it wanted to, uh, but in the same breath uh, push over an enormous tree, if that gets fancy. Another one of the distinguishing factors between African and Asian elephants, African elephants have two points on the tip of their trunk, and Asian elephant only has one. Why, I, I don't know. It's just the way they've evolved, I guess. that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days you are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert but as you know a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work because wild earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content but we want to let you know that we hear you and to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. is picking up as well that can be a bit of a limiting factor when trying to view wildlife in big open spaces like this Simambili open area I think the uh, the gusts of wind really mess with their senses makes it very difficult to um, to try and listen for danger to smell and um, the scent of predators and um, I think the movement of the grass is really quite frightening uh, but yeah, there is life out there somewhere. So uh, I think let's check in with James now to see how uh, the search for Tlalamba and youngsters off of Hyena Road is going this afternoon. The search is going very, very poorly at this stage. We had one lovely view of all three and then gone. Can't find the kill. Don't know where the leopards are. Hacking around. Just 
wondering if they didn't maybe drop it and have it stolen. We're going to keep searching around though. We do not want to give up. We would very much like to see these cats. This is how it goes. You see, I'd guaranteed myself an afternoon with them. And, uh, well, I possibly guaranteed myself an afternoon with them too soon. Then when I saw them walking this way, I thought, well, there's a kill, so they're not going to go far. They're not going to go fast. And then I took my sweet time getting around here. And now we have got Bubkiss. Not simply a lot of bush, stumps, thorns, thrashing twigs, and various other forms of vegetation able to do harm to the human being. Ow! Ow! And if they didn't go down there for a drink, there was a nice puddle. Maybe they were going down to the puddle for a drink. I know that this can be a little irksome to watch. Whoops, the daisies, that's a big hole. Kerry, now I think it is unlikely that they finished all the food, given that they had a diker and a nyala to eat. Oh, hang on. There they are. Okay. Right, we've got some Franklin's alarming. I'm pretty sure that they're off this way. Uh, Kerry, I think it's very unlikely that they would have finished all the food. Because, like I say, there was a lot of it. Just got to try and turn around in here. I'll do it as quickly as possible. We just heard some Franklin's going... Over that side. Hopefully that means that there's a leopard cat there and not an Afri African hawk eagle that has decided to murder one for his lunch. This is from the direction in which we've actually just come. Anyway, let's try and get through here. Watch your heads, everybody. It's along this game path, I think. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. Mild rotated white browed scrub. All right, let's go across to Chris. Give us a little bit of time in here, see what we can find. Right, we started to move up onto the hills, still ascending. And I wanna try and see and get to that one hill that we did the other day. There was one right up here. So we're in between these two copies, sort of like on a neck as we call it. I'll go and check there. It's just going slow because there's a lot of hidden rocks in this grass cover. So I'm probing every now and then with my stick to make sure that we have good footing. I always like to come and check what's up on these hills. It's a good place to look for butterflies, by the way. All sorts of plants here, especially male butterflies. 
because they have that tendency where the males tend to move up. Oh, look at this. This is what I was looking for. <laughs> there we go. So the male butterflies will do what we call hilltop hopping. So the more dominant ones will go further and further and further up the hilltops. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that pretty, eh? I think the post just stuck on a tree there. Wow, there's a whole bunch of them around here. We'll probably can get closer to some of them later, but we'll first just let you appreciate these beautiful aloe flowers. Hi there, Sandra. She wants to know why is it called a copy? Uh, Sandra, that's it's it's a a name that we use in Afrikaans that we inherited from Dutch, from the Dutch word kopje. In Afrikaans, it just became kopi, which refers to a smallish hill. Uh, there's no other way to explain it, really. It's it's the name for a small hill that we inherited from from Dutch, from you know which is the mother language from which Afrikaans developed. Remember, Afrikaans is a very, very different language already. It's evolved in its own. A lot of the words are still very similar, and that's where the name Kopi comes from. The funny thing is, a Kopi can also mean a teacup. <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's a funny language. My name is Solomon Lobu. I am working at Sengita Kruger National Park. I am very excited today to be one of the guys that have been nominated to select it to participate in the Safari Guide of the Year. I'm an activator. Uh, I like starting something, motivating others to become better. I am positive. You know, I like to um, focus on the positive sides of the situation. Here at Wild Earth, we promise great monthly prizes for our explorers, and this month is no exception. If you join our club before the 10th of July, then you stand a chance to win a fabulous Safari Guide online course brought to you by Bushwise Field Guides. They specialize in accredited Safari Guide training with courses tailored for the African Safari Lodge industry. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer today and don't miss out on this life-changing opportunity. So this would be the Kranz aloe, aloe barbarescence. It's the one that we find on these copies. Kranz means cliffs. <laughs> Mindy says it looks like they are on fire. Yes, and, and some, some language like in Afrikaans as well, they're called Firpele as well, which is a very generic name. This is an aloe. It, 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 it's a type of aloe. We know aloes make beautiful flowers. One thing that fascinates me that it's winter, it's, mid, it's right it's winter at the moment, and you get something flowering. So that provides nourishment for bees, for instance. I can see some bees collecting nectar. Obviously, the shape of the flower, once they open, it's a perfect little spot for sunbirds to come in as well. And these bright colors also suggest it will attract a whole bunch of pollinators. Right, I'm going to find another example of these. I see this whole bunch of them up here. In the meantime, let's go over to Liam to see what he's up to. Um, yeah, wishing Chris the best of luck um, over in the Pride Lens. Uh, hope he's having fun out there. Um, so we have made a nice loop all the way around um, these wonderful big open areas here on the Simbambili property. But um, I think with a bit of uh, road construction activity there, um, much of the wildlife has kind of been driven out of the area, as, as can happen. So uh, we will uh, make a similar plan, I think, continue on. There is certain to be life out there somewhere. 
find our elephant fix for the afternoon, I think. Fingers crossed. Having been away for about a month now myself, it's uh, quite nice to check um, on all of my favorite spots within our area of Traverse to see what they're all looking like, how the water is, see the potential for future sightings. Helen, that was a big bumble this morning, wasn't it? Um, we, I think both Panda and myself have buzzed the whole day about it. That was so exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, an excellent, excellent morning. Yeah, it's amazing. Panda and I were chatting a little bit earlier just about um, kind of going out into the bush wherever possible with an open mind. I mean, you go out this on some days and you say, I definitely want to find some lions. You almost set yourself up for disappointment. But head out with uh, as much of an open perspective as you can, and the bush will uh, never, ever disappoint you. Yeah, we had no expectations for a sighting of Tolumba this morning. We were hopeful and we saw tracks, and, but we sort of weren't panicking if that wasn't going to work out. We're just happy to be out there. And then uh, the unbelievable happened. What a pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Helen. We protect and reconnect nature across southern Africa. We bring countries together to care for wild spaces that stretch beyond borders. We protect and restore biodiversity. We prioritize the people living in these landscapes enabling them to thrive in harmony with nature. We are restoring tomorrow. It is certainly cooling down a bit this afternoon with the onset of this fairly steady breeze from the uh, northeast. Um, yeah, the temperature is dropping. I think this cloud is shifting. It's bound to be a chilly night tonight and a very cool morning tomorrow. Got some impala ahead, all sort of hung in a thicket. So let's just come around a little bit. And again, as I mentioned earlier, with it uh, being so windy, a lot of our herbivorous species, things like the uh, zebra, the impala, are much more keen to head into thickets where they're a bit more protected. Um, so I believe Chris has got some interesting wildflowers over in Pridelands, so maybe it might be worth popping over to him and uh, seeing what that's all about. Oh, well. Hello. Well, I wanted to show you, let's just look at the structure of this quickly. So obviously what's happening here, when the plant is about to flower, it makes these long sort of woody stalks that are very differently structured, structured branchlets as opposed to the actual leaf. Initially they're also green, so they do assist with photosynthesis. And then they branch out and they create these little arms where the flowers 
and ultimately the fruits develop and once the fruits disperse they weather out and they die and here's an example of an old one you can see where the fruits already have been taken off there's nothing left so it weathers wind all sorts of mechanisms causes it to weather and die off next year the same thing happens Hi there, George. Is it possible to tell the age of an aloe? Uh, George, I'm, I honestly don't know how to, to be totally honest with you. I've seen aloes of this size that I know has been older than 10 years. But then again, I've seen aloes bigger than that that's only two years old. So it all depends on where they grow, what the species are. This particular one doesn't grow very tall, for instance. It likes to creep or, you know. Um, there are some other aloes that are, are quite tall, almost like trees. So again, it depends on the species and so forth. But suppose you know, how old it is, I, it's not within my expertise to tell you exactly how old an aloe would be. This one, you can see it's been around for some time. I mean, it's got a number of areas where it started to grow. You can see these new nodes that come out creating new small sub aloes. And you can cut out those and plant them. They'll grow. They grow very easily from cutlings. And as you remember that aloe is also good medicine. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But as you know, a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work. Because Wild Earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content. But we want to let you know that we hear you. And to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Like I said, that is good medicine for burns, cuts, wounds, and then generally speaking, a good, very good sunscreen. Caroline, I'm not entirely sure if there's a scientific name for the juice of aloe. I'm sure there might be a specific, it's, it's basically a plant oil, a plant sap, but probably would have some specific name. I just don't know what it is. Hello, juice. <laughs> I don't know. But there's definitely different components. There's that oil. You can see it's almost mixed. There's the oil that comes out from just underneath the outside skin. And then there's the whitish fluid, clear watery fluid that comes from the flesh. And that oil especially is extremely bitter, and that's probably a defense mechanism, in addition to the thorns. So this one doesn't have so many thorns compared to, like, the Morolithii allies and those things. The Moroliths have everywhere little thorns, even on the surface of the blade of the, of the, of the leaves, even here. So obviously this one needs to be a lot more bitter, because it does have less protection in terms of thorns, as you can see on the side there. Very bitter stuff. I'm not even going to try and taste this again. That doesn't come out of your mouth. It's not toxic at all. It's edible. But rather be used for medicinal reasons. I've seen a variety of creatures, elephants, kudu, all sorts of things, eat it. Anyway. Let's see what Liam's up to on his bumble while I put this back. Over to Liam. A very cool 
little segment um, on some of the plant life, the succulent plant life on top of the copies there in Pridelands. I remember very fondly uh, trying to track down some impala and um, swazi lilies, or rather some impala and kudu lilies on the tops of those rocky outcrops uh, when I did a bit of a stint there. So yeah, hopefully there's uh, more cool stuff to see uh, from Chris's side. Yeah, coming into the dry season now, many of those sort of plants, aloes, impala lilies, etc., are starting to pop out their flowers. Um, yeah, it can be a very welcome bit of colour in the bush uh, when things are starting, just starting to look a bit drab and a bit dead. An excellent source of food for many of our pollinator species. Bees, the last few butterflies that are out. Yeah, so as we drive, we're passing these little splintered groups of impala all through these red bush willow and guari thickets. I think everybody just trying to stay out of the wind keep a bit sheltered and uh, probably more importantly try and stay away from the leopards and the lions. So coming up towards one eye pen. Nikita, certainly um, winter does. Thanks very much for that butterfly question. I'm uh, a very passionate amateur lepidopterist, a butterfly enthusiast. Um, so butterflies are ectothermic, they are cold-blooded, so they're affected by low temperatures and um, less access to sunlight in the winter. Um, also the fact that many of their food sources, not only the, um, the leafy foliage that the caterpillars need to eat, but um, also flowers that uh, the adult butterflies need to access in order to drink um, nectar, the sugary, uh, sugary sort of discharge from those flowers. Those are almost totally absent throughout the bush. Um, so life is very, very, very difficult for butterflies um, in the dry season. To be honest with you, most of them have um, a holo metabolic life cycle. It's totally finished um, in about a year. So their eggs will lie dormant. Those caterpillars hatch out when it begins to rain once again, when food sources are available, and then that butterfly has the chance to um, yeah, to mate and uh, produce more eggs and the cycle continues. Now there's a couple of species that we will see throughout the dry season, the African monarch or the African queen, sometimes called the plain tiger, can be seen, but um, that, yeah, certainly less. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. for a bit of corrugation in the road there, hence the, uh, the shudder in the picture. So I think, um, while well, Panda and myself make our way back onto Juma in search of uh, other exciting living things, let's check back in with fellow naturalist James, who I believe may have had some success.
mercifully, we have come up with the leopards. Now, if I was to describe what I have put myself and poor Gerrit through in the quest to find these leopards in exactly the very first place we found them, well, um, uh, it would not be a description that you'd enjoy, nor would it be a memory that Gerrit wishes to relive. So we shall pretend it didn't happen, and we shall take the last half hour of our lives and consign it to the scrap heap of forget. This, I think, is the female cub. It's very, very nice to make her acquaintance. The male is somewhere around here. The kill is under a bush, not far from here, and Tlalamba herself is not far from here. Now, this is an excellent, excellent way to rest. A nice pillow of elephant dung. Which I'm sure you'll agree looks extre <laughs> extremely comfortable. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> and having a little snooze as well. I'll be there shortly. <laughs> And I'm sure you're all very happy to see this kitty with us. I don't know where her brother is. Oh, I do, actually. I can just kind of see him. No, it's not him. It's just some movement in the bush where the kill is being devoured by one or t'other of mummy or son. At the moment, all we have is this female who's, well, I'm not sure that's her best angle. It's quite an amusing angle. So I think I was correct in just one thing this afternoon, and that was that they went to that nice little pool in this drainage gully to have a drink, and then they obviously circled back towards the kill, having headed off in a direction that led us on a merry goose chase. It wasn't very merry, it was a goose chase. A little bit of sun has come out, which is very nice. Oh, apparently this is actually the male cub. Thank you very much for that. Difficult to tell from, the, from this angle. I'm told the male is a 3-3 three, three and the female is a 5-5. Five, five. I can't see the spot pattern from here. Just looked like quite a feminine head. But they are only about 10 months old, so... I guess it's not surprising I made the mistake. But thank you very much for keeping us posted on that. Beautiful. Every so often a little bird comes flying over the top and gives a little alarm call. now giving us a beautiful little stare. Sailed by communications.
Connecting. Omega. Crash cut. Look at this pretty flower, and even in winter, look at this. I mean, I, I'm amazed at the amount of flowers that has emerged or are still around. You know, and that's partially due to the rains that we had late in May, unusually late. And uh, this is one of my favorite flowers. It's very common out here in most of the Mpumalanga and Limpopo low felt throughout the Kruger especially on dry, woody, rocky slopes of kopis. Loves these granitic areas where there's lots of coarse gravelly soils. It doesn't even have a common name, we just know it as Gnidia, named after the genus Gnidia. G-N-I-D-I-A, Gnidia. And this particular species, Gnidia rubescens. I don't even know it's common and if, if, if it's had one. But look at that. It is so, so pretty. It almost looks out of place in a way. One would not expect such a type of flower here. This just doesn't seem like an African flower. Hello there, Jacob, who's 12 years old. He's asking which plant has the funniest name. Sure. Jacob, I'm going to have to think on that one. One that I can think of is elephant's pudding, which is also found up in these hills. Plant related to grapes. And for the more adult viewers, it's in the genus Sissus. I think I have showed you this. Jacob, if I do see it again, I will show you the elephant's pudding. And as the name suggests, elephant love it. So I think that's one that I can think of. If I do think of any more, I will, I will definitely air it. But there are plenty of plants with ridiculous names. <laughs> this one doesn't have a name. It just has its own scientific name, Nidia rubescens. Very pretty. With a slew of potential dangers lurking, it's essential to be aware of your surroundings whilst walking in the wilderness. 20 yards away from one of the most endangered species. This is a big bull. What a moment, what a close encounter with an early bull. He's just over here now. He's moved completely away. Being on a bushwalk and seeing a leopard I mean, it's ridiculous to be this close to a leopard on foot and for him not to run is absolutely insane. How crazy was that? Through the gap there is just the back of the head of a male lion. He is absolutely unaware that we are here right now. I tell you, seeing lions on foot, is, it, it, it definitely brings out the caveman in you, this little scared human being. We have a, a comment from Flora. Hello there, Flora. It says, thanks, Chris, for showing us the plants. It's so interesting to see all parts of the bush. And Flora, yes, absolutely. You know what? Out here at Eco Training, especially where we are also training the new and upcoming guides, it's also important to expose them to everything that is out here as much as we can. And I like to also bring that to you as well. Amanda, hello there. Uh, Amanda wants to know if there are any flowers that are classified as endangered. Um, yes, indeed. Now, there's quite a number. I can't really name them all because there are plenty. Um, there is even some flowers that's probably not been discovered yet or listed or classified that's already gone extinct much like with insects and scientists do rediscover or discover new species every year 
And remember, trees are also a flowering plant, so there are definitely a few endangered or protected trees. It's do different things. One plant that I do know is in South Africa quite endangered with regards to the Kruger Park, and it's called the Summer Impala Lily, as opposed to the Impala Lily that we generally see growing. So the Summer Impala Lily, beautiful pink flower, and that is one of the most endangered flowering small plants in the park because their distribution is very marginal into the park. It's almost like as if there's like a little bit of leopard spots in between all those flowers. And that makes me think maybe we should head over to James to get an update on the leopards. And can you see it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we left the leopards just simply because we had a call about these dogs and we lost signal. And so we thought we'd just quickly come and have a look at the dogs and see what they were doing before we head back to those cats. They are over the northern boundary. So this might be the only view that we get. That, in fact, might be the last view. We get. But at least we got to see them. They were talking to us there, asking us if we caught them. We did. Um, let me just go back a bit and see if we can't get another view. I think that might be it. Even the Dutch, uh, they love the plants just on the of such uh, visual store, kind of good for tumors, even one of them. Ah, uh, here we go. We'll get a good view now. A goodish view. Uh, let's say when. Is that fine? Stations, um, please keep me posted on space in that Tlalamba log. I'll come back when there's some space. There we go. Wild dogs and leopards. It's a way to spend an afternoon, really. And I'm always minded, especially on a Monday, of how spectacular it is to be able to do this sort of job. Yep. <laughs> Ollie, were, I think, ready for some more plants, were you? Well, that's. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We have now got wild dogs. Um, we're not going to stay too long with them. We are going to try and make our way. Spots. Oh, you're waiting for spots. Yes, fair enough. He was expecting more spots. Uh, we will go back to the spots, but we just had to make a little bit of space there so that the other vehicles could get in and have a look. And I thought because the view wasn't that great, we'd quickly come out here and have a look at the dogs and give the cats a little bit of time to sleep before we go back and have a look there. That's my plan anyway. The dogs are also having a very good rest. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But, as you know, a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work. Because Wild Earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content. But we want to let you know that we hear you. And to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. 
So there it is. I imagine that they will get moving in about an hour or so. Until then, I think that there's going to be very little action. And then we'll make our way back to the kitties. Well, not once they've started moving. Uh, before they start moving, I think. We're just going to, like I say, give a bit of time to the guys from the other reserves to spend some time with Tlalamba. And then we'll head back there. There can only be... Two, si two vehicles in that sighting, as far as I'm aware. As this is the sort of sighting, everybody, where your questions and comments are extremely appreciated because, as you can see, while we are looking at a highly endangered wild dog, they're not exactly setting the world alight with a performance. Dark man lover, you say a wild dog hunt would be incredible. It certainly would be absolutely fantastic. And unfortunately, this time of the day, it's highly unlikely to occur. But nevertheless, it should be, it would be amazing to watch. Uh, the big gamble, especially when you're sitting with dogs over here, is that they could easily just head north. And if they take even three or four more steps towards the north, which is basically towards where they're facing, that will be the end of our view of them because we cannot go there. That is the problem with human property laws. Gloria, no, the other way round. Wild dogs would not necessarily steal a leopard's kill. I mean, they might if it was very fresh and there and, you know, it happened to be lying around and it had just been killed. But wild dogs are really not scavengers. They are much more um, hunters and uh, we, we often see leopards stealing from wild dogs. So leopards, I don't know if they track them. They may well track them, but they certainly get attracted by the noise of them feeding on a kill. And I've often seen leopards leap out from behind a bush, especially if there's a tree close by, grab whatever the wild dogs have and then take it up a tree. And they are so fast off the mark and they react with such speed that the wild dogs can almost do nothing about it. And I've often seen it, especially with young male leopards. Young male leopards obviously take a huge amount of, uh, or a huge number of chances compared with others. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. And while they are asleep, you can see those ears going all the time, listening, flicking off flies, probably mainly flicking off flies, I suspect, and listening to our voices. Three. I can three, three of them, yeah. Yeah, we've definitely got three there. All right, let's go across to Chris, see what he's doing, 
and I will probably wait here until there's a space in the leopard sighting. Well, it seems like Henry is on fire today. Well done. Anyway, coming back to what we've got here, you know, the bush is not always about the pleasant things. Sometimes there are some unpleasant things and the whole cycle of life, nutrients, carbon, energy, everything needs to cycle and recycle. Otherwise the system will collapse. So therefore we also take time to look and appreciate some of the sadder things. And here's obviously a young leopard tortoise who did not survive. Now I don't know what's the cause of death. So let's just check here. This would be part of its shell. I'll turn it around just to look at the inside. It's really that we can actually see the inside. See how the ribs and the shell is fused into one structure there. Anyway, it's definitely been chewed by something. I'm going to turn it back to where it was so we can take a look at the edge there. And one can see it's been chewed. It's not a very big tortoise. It's about the size of my hand. So when they are adult, there's very few things that predate on them. The youngsters, however, can be taken by hyena. I've seen a hyena chew them. I've even seen a honey badger. I've seen lions chew them. And then obviously ground hornbills is probably their main predator. The eggs, however, are being predated upon by snakes, lizards, monitor lizards, jackals, badgers, all sorts of things that eats their, their eggs. And that's why a female will lay up to seven clutches in a season, in the rainy season. Every time she lays a clutch of eggs, anything from five to 30 at a time, usually in holes that they seldom dig themselves usually old abandoned artifark holes or something like that or any little hole that they can find that they can fit into sometimes under leaf cover but again she does that about six to seven times in a season in a rainy season in order to have a lot of these youngsters around firstly a lot of the eggs will be eaten then once they hatch more of them won't survive Abigail wants to know what would the shell's role be in the ecosystem now. Abigail, the most obvious and you know, probably the most important is the nutrients that's contained in there. And there's a whole bunch of organic stuff there, like calcium, that's going to be recycled. And the way that happens is obviously something is eaten that, so that's being digested by something. But this will slowly decompose and it will return nutrients, carbon and energy back into the system. Not necessarily into the soil, but into the system. The problem is the inside is bone. Let me just get something I can probe with here. But these outer bits, so the bone, there are a lot of things that can eat them. So I'm just gonna take one of those scoots off. So it's underneath that scoots, that's bone. A number of things that will consume them. These scutes are keratin, so there's not a lot of things that eat hardened keratin like that, so that can actually lie for ages. Let's say this tortoise is probably in a region of about four or five years old. It's not a very old tortoise. Bear in mind they only reach sexual maturity at about 12 to 15 years of age. My name is Nico Britz. I am originally from Cape Town. I worked in the Eastern Cape for about nine years before I started working at Bushwise Field Guides in the Low Felt, uh, close to Makalali Private Game Reserve. So I'm hoping that by doing this, this could inspire the younger or newer guides coming into the industry to do the same. Hello everyone. My name is Ruan Grobler. I'm from Lion Sands Game Reserve and being nominated for the Safari Guide of the Year came as somewhat of a surprise to me. I was very excited and quite nervous as well in the beginning uh, to tackle this task, but it's, it's, it's quite a prestigious event 
and it, it means that you were recognized and I'm quite happy to be recognized. It means quite a lot to me. <laughs> Hello there, Willy. <laughs> Says now all I need is a leopard in the shape of a cat. Yeah, that will be amazing. I think I've, 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 I've depleted my leopard luck here yesterday. I've got a feeling it's going to be a couple of days before I'm lucky again with a leopard. But this brings us close. This brings us close. It is a leopard tortoise. Well, the bush is presenting us with a lot of small things today. I'm going to be out again looking for some more interesting small things. In the meantime, let's go back to Liam. Uh, Chris, I don't think you've run out of leopard luck at all. I was just chatting to, to Panda about um, Chris's two Pridelands leopard sightings in recent weeks. That is pretty exquisite by, uh, by that sort of area's standards. An unbelievable result. So I think there's a couple more leopards in store for Chris. Uh, but what an exciting afternoon it has turned into. Uh, wild dogs, Tlalamba and cubs, a very nice general game, cool plants, butterflies, flowers. It has been uh, mega successful. Even if it was all to come to a, a stop right now, it would have still been a wonderful afternoon. But wait, we've got hours left. <laughs> so there's bound to be something else in store. So I think uh, for Panda and myself, we are planning to head a little bit further down into the um, into the south, potentially cross into Chitwa and uh, check out what is happening around uh, Chitwa Dam, another one of my favourite haunts on this um, uh, this sort of property. So let's see. As I always say, uh, never a bad afternoon out in the bush. Uh, some elephant tracks in the road. We were talking about elephants a little bit earlier. Maybe we can get our elephant fixed down here somewhere. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But as you know, a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work. Because Wild Earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content. But we want to let you know that we hear you. And to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. I think uh, Panda and myself are probably going to try and spend a bit of time uh, sniffing around for uh, these elephants. The tracks do look promising, but while we uh, continue with that mission, I think let's head back over uh, to James with uh, that wonderful sighting that he had a little bit earlier, his wild dogs. Uh, they are doing the same thing that they were doing a little bit earlier. They are having a bit of a snooze. And that's about all. James Richard says that this is the pack of four that's been around here for a while. Uh, I believe him entirely. And so uh, you've obviously spent a bit of time with these dogs 
over the last little while. Oh, action stations, look at that. There's a dog moving, I can't believe it. Two dogs moving. Absolutely astounding scenes here. Dog scratching, fleas, ticks, all manner of skin infections. I assure you, a wild dog is not an animal that you would eat a meal off. I'm just going to go back a little bit. Rosemary, you think the wild dogs would like a song? Well, there is a vehicle full of guests behind us, but I will give them a small song. Here it comes, straight back down towards Juma. The song is called Wild Dog, Wild Dog, Come Back to Juma. Wild dog, wild dog, come back to Juma. Come and see what treats we have for you. Wild dog, wild dog, come back to Juma. Come and see what treats we have for you. Delicious impalas, delicious dikers, and the old steering book too. Wild dog, wild dog, come back to Juma and see what we have for you. Did you like that song? I thought it was world class. Ferret looks like he's going to punch me in the face. I think that's pretty good, made up on the cuff. I can see that my wife's eyes are rolling into the back of her head as I was giving my little song. Yeah, rolling trouble. The smell currently is not too bad because we're not very close to them. I just got a whiff. There we go. Pretty, pretty rough, pretty rough stink there. I'm just going to turn. You can get a better view. And now we can see Africa's painted wolf in all its glory. Uh, it does seem to be only three of them. They'd have a little greeting ceremony, smell each other. No doubt it's a fairly foul affair, given the sensitivity of their noses. You may be able to hear the dim crackle of rifle fire in the background. It is, in fact, cameras very enthusiastically taking pictures. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. You say you loved my song. I do my best. I put the current total of photographs taken of these dogs at around about 7,800 now. <laughs> and right now, an enormous cannon has been brought to bear. Phew. I must tell you, the vehicle next to me looks like the Black Pearl as it draws broadside against There are about 400 lenses faced at this, these hapless dogs. <laughs> so some very nice equipment. I'd like to steal quite a lot of it. Speaking of piracy, I'd quite like to steal some. 
The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. Definitely two females. I'm assuming the one on the ground is a male, but maybe not. That's actually a really cool sighting. Maddie, the dogs are not far from the spots at all. They're about, well, as the crow flies, maybe 700 meters or so, which is not very far. That is in feet. I suppose you could work it out in feet. I can't believe this. Um, in feet, what is it? 700 meters times 3.3. Just call it 700 yards. It's much easier. Let's go across to Liam. He's apparently on an elephant search. Let's find out if he's found any elephants. So uh, we are um, we're on lock with a beautiful breeding herd of elephants. Lovely big herd of Ellies. Success for Panda and myself after a remarkably short tracking mission. Um, we had a good sense that those tracks were fresh, and uh, boom, there we go. Just what the doctor ordered. We were after some Ellie's this afternoon, doing what they do best, uh, filling their tremendous bellies. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, this is obviously only my second drive uh, back with Wild Earth uh, on this cycle. When I left here a month ago, um, this place was inundated with elephants. You could almost go as far as to say you couldn't go around a corner without seeing more. But the guys tell me that has shifted. Uh, perhaps something to do with uh, kind of the rains being over, the bush starting to dry out. Um, early numbers have sort of dwindled. I guess the breeding herds have moved out. And it's apparently becoming a little bit more challenging at times to spot them. So we are very happy to be sat with uh, this group, the Savi. Yeah, that's the beauty of guiding once again um, in a natural open system with enough space uh, for the animals that uh, reside within it to move as, uh, as they need to, as the seasons take them. It kind of keeps us on our toes as guides and cam ops as well. Vince, from Leopard Whisperer to Elephant Whisperer, I will take it. <laughs> Thanks for your comment. I've always said if there was one animal I could uh, actually talk to, it would be the elephant, if I could choose. I think they would have a whole lot to say to us. Think of all the knowledge that must be stored in that tremendous brain. Um, we're going to reposition slightly. These Ellie's moving straight down Twin Dams Road now. <coughs> Success! Yeah, it's 
tough to say how big this group is, but it's stretched all the way down Twin Dams Road, so maybe 30, 40 individuals, something like that. I'd be guessing. But this enormous great individual off to my right is undoubtedly the herd's matriarch. Um, I make that assumption on a couple of factors. Um, yeah, her size is probably the biggest factor. She's arguably the largest female in this group. But then there's kind of an overall feel to an elephant as well. Um, a very mature female, a bit like a very mature person. Uh, their skin seems to sag a little bit more. And they get these lovely sort of lumps and bumps all over their head. A bit of a sunken nature to the skin on the skull. And for me, the curtains on the back of the ear. So the ears seem to keep growing and growing and growing. And the older the elephant, the uh, lower the curtains on the rear, the rear side of the upper edge of the ear uh, will actually hang. I'm sure she'll turn her head at some stage and um, and show us. Yeah, now it is her role in this family to guide, to mentor ultimately steering the uh, greater group down pathways she was shown by her mother. The secret to success for an elephant family uh, rides on the ability of that uh, female to tap into, uh, into memories stored deep in that consciousness. Her ability to remember the secret pathways to fruiting trees and the last remaining water holes when it gets very dry. Uh, that'll mean success or failure in terms of the survival of uh, the young. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But as you know, a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work. Because Wild Earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content. But we want to let you know that we hear you. And to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. I think uh, we may actually pull a little bit further down Twin Dams Road, maybe try and get a view of uh, some other individuals in this group, perhaps even a couple more of the youngsters. Um, Halley, thanks very much for your question. You've asked with regards to tusk length and uh, utilizing that to determine the age of an elephant. Um, talk about long in the tooth. Unfortunately, um, no. So um, I think the, uh, the factors that determine the length of elephant tusks, um, probably the greatest factor of all is genetics. So some elephants quite simply develop much longer tusks than others. I've seen, um, I've seen a young bull in the greater Kruger, probably 25 years of age, with tusks that are over three feet long, over a meter long. At the same time, I've seen uh, elephant bulls in their 50s with no tusks at all. Some Ellies develop tusks, some Ellies are tuskless. 
Um, a general assumption is that the tusks will be quite long on an individual that has tusks, that is quite old. Uh, but no, I wouldn't say it would be a very accurate uh, way to uh, decipher elephant ages at all. But um, thanks for your question there, uh, Hallie. So yeah, I think, um, I think we're going to press on a little bit, uh, a little bit further down, hopefully pick out some more members of this group. Yeah, so the, uh, the Kruger's elephant population, or the greater Kruger, are not famed for elephants with um, broadly uh, very large tusks. Our Ellies tend to have fairly average sized tusks. Um, you compare that to populations in other parts of Africa famous for large numbers of um, great tuskers. Um, yeah, we're sort of not known. There are obviously exceptional individuals out there always. But um, generally, our elephant tend to have more average, average length tusks. Possibly, though, quite a good thing um, in that we don't seem to attract too much attention from ivory poaching. Touch wood. Uh, where other parts of Africa where elephant are known for massive ivory, those places being totally hammered by um, illegal efforts, people coming into reserves to shoot the elephants at night. Take the tusks. <laughs> So uh, we are going to hang around for as, as long as possible with these lovely illies. We're in no hurry at all to leave them. We're going to try and soak up as much of the sighting as we can. While Panda and myself do that, though, I think let's cross back over to James, who uh, may have uh, rejoined that incredible sighting of Tlalamba. Back to the spots. That is a leopard, not a wild dog. You can tell the difference from the blackness on the back of the ears. Dogs don't have quite the same shade of black on the back of their ears. Otherwise, it is very diff easy to confuse wild dogs with leopards. This is a leopard. Now, all three of them are around here. All three of them are in quite thick grass, and so we don't have the best view right now, but we're now going to hang around here for the foreseeable future and see if we do not get a better view of all three of the leopards. This one is on a termite mound, and I think this is the female, not the male, which we had earlier. The male, 3-3 three, three spot pattern. The female, 5-5 five, five spot pattern. Thank you for the information. Sharia, and from James Richard. And then Tlalamba herself, Mama T, as I like to call her, as of exactly three seconds ago, is eating one of the poor animals that was um, sort of calmly walking through this area and were then killed. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year we'll be heading to Bushwa's Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. What we can ask her to do is to turn the camera to a very fascinating piece of biology that is 
occurring on the front of the vehicle. Louis, you say you have a happy heart today, I do too, but there's some real action going on on the dashboard currently, where there is a caterpillar attempting to make its way off my lace and onto my leg. Is it possibly trying to g gain access to my vascular system through that scab, which was a, mos a mosquito bite? <laughs> anyway, that is, that is uh, what you might term an inchworm, which is in fact a caterpillar. And actually there is some quite interesting biology here. If you look towards the right-hand side of the animal in question, you can see that it has got four what apparently look like legs. These are not legs. They are suckers. And the suckers are on the rear end of the caterpillar. And because the caterpillar is an insect, we know that it has six legs, and the six legs are just... Whoops, sorry, I do apologize. I didn't mean to give you a concussion. It's got six legs there on the that bit there. Like all insects, it's got six legs. And there will be six legs, of course, when it is a butterfly or moth, if it ever gets that far. I don't hold out a great deal of hope for it, its future. There, you can see it's six legs now, next to the scab. Stunning. <laughs> Alexis, you say no cease. No, there's nothing cease about this. This thing's now pretending to be a stick. You can see he's gone rigid with fear. He's pretending to be a stick. I think I should probably put him back in the bush. Um, unfortunately, with something like this, when you put them back in the bush, um, <laughs> they are generally, or they generally have a specific food plant that they'd eat. And I don't know which food plant this came off. And, it, you know, been driving through this bush trying to find these cats earlier. And so it's probably come off one of these bushes. And if it doesn't sit on the right food plant, it's not going to be able to eat properly. And it will either starve to death or be eaten by a bird. Sad and sorry state of affairs. Well, my name is Mark Carantonis, and I'm the co owner of a travel company called Africa Direct. And I'm from White River in, in Mpumalanga, and I'm the founder of Safari Guide of the Year. It takes a lot of courage, you know, to put your hand up and say, I'm in. To put yourself forward and say, I'm here to learn, it's not possible without them. My name is Michelle Duplessis and I'm the Managing Director of the Field Guides Association of Southern Africa. I'm one of the judges this year and I'll be judging the Game Drive category as well as hospitality, professionalism and storytelling. I really look forward to seeing everybody again this year and obviously to meet the incredible contestants. Righty. Oh, I thought we had some action there. We don't have any action. But we're not going to worry. We're going to be patient in the extreme. And we'll move around in probably about five or six minutes. In the meantime, let's go across to Chris and see if he's found some action in the copies of Pride Lands. When you just start probing, start looking, you find some very interesting little things around. Now, this is, okay, so it's a plant. Now, as Mpo comes closer, go take a look at this before I tell you what it is. Very weird thing. Now, at first glance, this thing looks like an euphorbia. Most of, a lot of the euphorbias have these sort of quadrangular or, or sort of edged branches. However, if we break this open, it does not have the milky latex that you will find with euphorbias. It smells good. It's probably edible. 
kudus eat it. I've seen rabbits or hares eating it, impalas, elephants. So this is not the elephant's pudding that I told Jacob about earlier. It is very closely related. It's also in the genus Sissus. In this case, it's got a very beautiful scientific name. Sissus, which is um, it's a relative of grapes. Quadrangularis. You can see because of the quadrangular stems. Now you can identify it firstly by the quad. Well, if it's not a euphorbia, one, what is it? So, grape related. You can see it, you know, it's got these four edges, this leathery, leathery sort of edge. And you've got these nodes, usually about 8 to 10 centimeter. These are young ones. And then in between each node, you see this sort of uh, what we refer to as a. It's not a trifoliate leaf, it is a simple leaf, so it's not a trifoliate leaf. But it has three points and it's dentate, so it's got it's toothed. It's called a trilobe leaf. So the leaf itself has three lobes, but it is one single leaf. So it's a simple leaf. And if it was a compound leaf with three pieces, it would have been a trifoliate leaf. So in this case, it's a trilobe, a toothed trilobe leaf. Remember, grapes also have a similar leaf. This plant is related to grapes. They do create berries as well. And those are edible, although they are somewhat bitter. Interesting. You can even see here yeah, something is eaten. A bit of it. There's one that's been eaten. Zachary, this wants to well, Zachary wants to know if we can plant this in your garden. Yes, Zachary. They grow very quickly. Uh, you just literally try and harvest some of the rhizomes in the bottom, plant them, they grow very easily and they grow very quickly as well. And they're quite pretty as well. It occurs all the way from here throughout most of subtropical Africa into Asia. It's used as medicine even there. It's been used by a lot of cultures up in Asia as an analgesic and antibacterial agent. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But as you know, a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work. Because Wild Earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content. But we want to let you know that we hear you. And to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. And you need to be careful because there are some euphorbias that look the same. So you need to know how this plant looks. And euphorbias are mostly very, very toxic. So let's head over to Liam while I find us some more treasures. So some very cool uh, garden ideas there from Chris. I was certainly listening. Um, but we are still sat here on Twin Dams Road, a little bit further north of Twin Dams itself, with our nice breeding herd of elephants. Looks like they may be cutting a little bit more, uh, little bit more southeast down towards the Moloati drainage line. So we may have to leave them in the next few. But uh, it has been so nice to soak up a bit of this afternoon sun with this incredible herd of pachyderms. Uh, while you guys were in Pridelands with Chris uh, Pandit and myself, we're just chatting about the value of elephants uh, um, simply in terms of providing sightings and they are like the ultimate thing to have out in the bush 
so reliable. They're um, almost always present. And the activity is constant. They virtually never stop eating, never stop moving around. Um, I doubt very much I would ever get bored of uh, sitting with Ellis. Of all of the outrageous, varied and incredible species that we do deal with out in the bush, I don't think anything has got the presence that um, an elephant, an elephant actually has. Timber. <laughs> this young bull doing some uh, pretty destructive alterations to this little russet bush willow tree. Breaking off a few spare branches. That is one thing about the Ellies, though, the, the population of elephant in the Greater Kruger, they are extremely destructive. Um, it's not really their fault, it's just what they are, it's how they behave, it's what they do. But, um, yeah, the wake of destruction uh, that follows behind a herd of elephant is um, unparalleled. And if there is an Im imbalance in the environment, if you do have too many elephant uh, with the inability to move, um, out of a fenced area into fresh areas uh, with good heavy vegetation loads and the elephant do start to do some serious damage and that will start to affect other species. Uh, the best possible hope for uh, populations of elephant in Africa are wildlife corridors. So corridors developed between reserves and even potentially between countries. Um, to try and facilitate enough enough natural elephant movement to protect the environment. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. I think while we perhaps try and uh, position ourselves to get one last view of this uh, great group of Ellies, let's cross back over to James now um, to see what Lady Tlalamba is up to. We've moved around and we're now looking at the female. This is the 5'5 five five female. I must say, I thought the male looked smaller than her, but it's probably just a lack of familiarity with them. I have yet to see the golden orbs of the male, and therefore I'm going purely on the spot pattern that I've been told about. Beautiful cat, totally relaxed, just like his mother. His mother is eating. She's in some very thick bush currently, so we're just going to enjoy her. Enjoy. Sorry, I keep saying him. We're just going to enjoy her. <laughs> Don't 
to slip, wait for that vehicle to stop. I suppose the advantage is that she's looked up to see who's arrived. It's not a celebrity, so she's now going to sleep. And I'm just going to hang around here until there's some kind of meeting of the three, or at least two of them. Doesn't look extremely impressed. Bella, you say, is it true that leopards have the shortest legs out of the big cats? Well, let's go through the big cats. Jaguar, or Jaguar in the United States. Uh, mountain lion or cougar. That should take care of the Americas. Asia has got leopards and cheetahs and lions and tigers. And we've got leopards and lions and cheetahs. So, yeah, I'd say it is true that leopards have the shortest legs of the big cats. They are the smallest of the big cats, I suppose. I mean, I think a cougar is probably similarly sized. A jaguar is bigger, a tiger is bigger, a lion's bigger. A cheetah is definitely taller, although weighs roughly the same. So, yeah probably do have the shortest legs by virtue of the fact that they are the shortest. Proportionately, yeah, they don't stand tall. They certainly don't stand tall like a cheetah does. I don't know enough about a puma or cougar to know how tall they stand. Uh, jaguars, I imagine, must have a very similarly proportioned set of limbs, given that their strategy is very similar. And in fact, they're even stockier. So I couldn't comment necessarily on the comparison proportionately of jaguars and leopards. Jaguars are taller. I mean, they're bigger animals. And she's just looking off towards where there are some Franklin's alarm calling. In fact, exactly around where I was looking for these cats. Uh, what, about two hours ago now, I think? Yeah. Your trekking is very good. What is the starting trekking? Just trek the leopard. You walk a little bit, you stop. You can start in checking. Keep your hands, your neck up, okay, your eyes. Listen for the birds. You follow the leopard. The leopard should see you first. You lose. Talk next year. Uh, my name is Juan Pinto. I'm here for Safari Guard of the Year. I'm one of the judges. One of the categories in the competition is the walk or the on foot experience, as you call it. And it's kind of the leveler. It's the experience that really, really is important for a guide to have to be able to take people safely into the environment on a walk. Anyway, it's very nice and peaceful here. I gotta tell you, spending two or three hours in the company of a pride of leopards like this is just magical much more so than it would be for lions which would be flat on their sides not looking up probably soiling the ground around them smelling up the place and they'd only get going or start moving as the sun went down whereas these cats will generally be a lot busier especially during the day Here's some frogs calling. There must be surely the last frogs of the season. And you can obviously also hear human beings speaking quite loudly. They are excited guests. And the excited guests are enjoying the sights of these leopards. Two vehicles. The 
the lights slowly starting to fade. I always find it fascinating also that in a situation like this, the mother and youngsters won't eat together. They will all eat separately. And it's such a kind of, I suppose, what's the word that's disappeared from my mind? A forerunner slash, um, what am I trying to say? A uh, harbinger, but a better word than harbinger. It's a harbinger of things to come when they will become so independent and, in fact, jealously guard their independence as they get older. And just do not feed together. Hello, Harper, aged nine. Well, I'm going to let you count them. I don't know how many whiskers leopards have, Harper, but you can count them there. Should we count them together? Here we go. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, two, three, four, five, twenty-seven. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 27. That's a guess, Harper. I don't know if they're really 27 on each side, but roughly 27 on each side. And if you multiply that by two, what do you get, Harper? 27 times two is, that's it, nearly there. And yeah, correct, 54. So probably somewhere between 50 and 70 whiskers, I guess. Remember, they've also got those funny little whiskers above their eyes. So if we zoom in just above the eyes there, you can see those funny little whiskers there. Probably, let's say, six on each side. So 54 plus six takes us to 60. That's a really interesting question, actually, Harper, because I don't know if all leopards have the same number of whiskers. Perhaps you could do a scientific experiment and go around your neighborhood, knock on the doors, and say, may I examine your kitty cat, please? And any house cats that you find, you can count all their whiskers. And then once you've, got a, once you've counted the whiskers of at least, say, 20 cats, you can tell us if they have the same number of whiskers or if there's a difference. I wouldn't suggest you do that if you live in Johannesburg, but if you live in a leafy suburb in the United States, perhaps it would be a safe and enjoyable activity for you during the summer. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest you do it in Johannesburg. been fortunate to be working in the guiding industry for about 26 years now. I've also been fortunate enough to do nine years of the 10 years um, as one of the judges and the particular components that I do is the walking and the shooting exercises. If you're the winner, if you're going to be the winner, it's important to become an ambassador for the field guide industry and competitors in the future. And we are now looking at the young cub uh, that's eating there. I feel sick with embarrassment. That's amazing. You know, as I was looking at this cat, I thought, gosh, she does look so like her mother and is almost the same size <laughs> as her mother. <laughs> and lo and behold, lo and, lo and, lo and behold, it is the number. Thank you, Final Control, for that. Um, they said they thought they were looking at Lumber too, but thought that they'd better let so the supposed expert make the decision. And, uh, well, I now want to dig a large hole and climb into it and never come out. 
It's looking more and more like Columba as I watched her. <laughs> Thanks, Scarlett. Thank you. Thank, thanks for your help there. Um, Look, on the grand scale of wrongs committed in the world today, that's a very small one. All right, we're going across to Liam now. Uh, please don't tell him what I've just done. Uh, I feel too embarrassed for words. So, uh, my goodness, what an exciting afternoon it has turned into um, here in South Africa's Lowfeld region. Uh, between Pridelands and ourselves, just a beautiful, beautiful early dry season um, drive in the bush. Um, so, Panda and myself are sat here on Chitra Dam Wall, another one of my total favorite spots um, here in the concession, just enjoying a bit of bird life. Um, a bit of the usual uh, tomfoolery from the hippos. Just soaking up the scene, listening for uh, our next update in terms of a sighting. An update from the bush, maybe a rasp, an alarm call, a roar. You never know. Um, there's an immense stillness to um, to the atmosphere uh, when you are out and about um, in the dry season, especially this time of the afternoon. These sort of late late afternoon, early evening periods. There is, of course, all of the bird noise and all of that, but it's it's just a wonderful, peaceful time to be out. Haley, I'm with you 100%. Chitra is uh, such a special place. Certainly very happy to be able to traverse uh, through this phenomenal area. It uh, does not disappoint. Yeah, quite a few bird calls around us. I'm hearing red-billed oxpeckers, yellow-billed hornbills. I um, heard a black-headed oriole. Sammy, so hippos would leave their territory for uh, potentially a couple of reasons. Um, seasonal constraints are probably the biggest. So um, hippos are obviously completely reliant on the water. They need to um, have access to uh, fairly deep water, water deep enough um, that they may actually submerge their bodies and defend themselves from uh, exposure to too much sun. But a big limiting factor is grazing. So in uh, droughts that we've gone through before where we did have water in some of the dams, um, hippos are not able uh, to access food um, at sort of the worst of it. Um, with areas around the water being heavily, heavily overgrazed, hippos have got to go further and further every single night in search of enough sustenance to keep themselves alive. So it will actually get to a point where a hippo actually cannot stay in the water anymore because it has to travel uh, to try and find enough food. So a hippo may leave its territory for that reason. Uh, it could potentially be uh, with regards to a dispute with other hippos. Uh, perhaps a bull is ousted by um, a bigger, more dominant male, and then he's forced to, to move on, give up his territory, give up his cows. But yeah, they're pretty dependent on prime spots like this Chitra Dam. 
I'm sure this dam hosts two or three dominant bulls. There's enough space for them to sort of stay out of each other's way. Here at Wild Earth, we promised great monthly prizes for our explorers, and this month is no exception. If you join our club before the 10th of July, then you stand a chance to win a fabulous Safari Guide online course brought to you by Bushwise Field Guides. They specialize in accredited Safari Guide training with courses tailored for the African Safari Lodge industry. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer today and don't miss out on this life-changing opportunity. Bit of activity from a very big bull at the center of the frame there. We've just seen him uh, haul his posterior out of the water and defecate quite violently, um, wriggling his tail, flicking it up all over himself, all over the bank. Undoubtedly a territorial bull. Mbali hippos absolutely do get affected by uh, changes of season. Um, certainly with regards to the availability of uh, the water in which they need to um, to live and obviously to drink as well but um, largely as well the um, the amount of grass um, that is available but obviously uh, the change of seasons is quite natural um, it's not uh, not a disaster it just tests populations so if there are any weaker hippos uh, in this Chitra Dam group, or these three groups, um, the onset of the dry season will almost certainly weed out the weaker ones. Those are the ones that don't find enough food, start to lose condition, and eventually uh, find up, uh, end up losing their lives. Yeah, that is uh, natural selection. Uh, one of Darwin's uh, earliest principles. That is uh, one of the base uh, level functions of the natural world. Weed out the weak so that only the uh, the fittest, uh, the very best are left behind to breed, leaving populations stronger with each generation. So I think as the light is dipping, we may move a little bit further down the dam wall now. I'd love to check that uh, log um, just off on the one side to see if our little crocodile hatchlings are still around. Uh, they were here a month ago when I was here. It'd be wonderful to see if they've grown at all. I'm sure they have. But while we do that, let's uh, cross back over to James to see how low light is affecting his sighting um, of Clalumba and the cubs. Uh, the light is dipping on the side on account of the fact that Liam and I are, in fact, in, well, roughly the same place. And so, yes, the light is dipping on this side. Uh, this is Tlalamba, the leopard, in case you were wondering. Uh, I obviously am very good at identifying animals and uh, this is Tlalumba the leopard her cubs are either side of her the female feeding on the kill and the male on the termite mound and I mean it's it's now very obvious to me why the male looked smaller than her on account of the fact that he is in fact her son
Many of you pointed this out. Thank you for that. Uh, very gently, actually. None of you took to Twitter to tell me that I'm a blithering idiot, which would have been entirely, entirely uh, understandable thing for you to have done. Somebody called what sounds like Marip Lover uh, says that it is a great honor spending time with these cats. I would agree with you. I don't think that's your name, but I would agree with you. No, oh, it is your name, Marip's lover. So the rocks lover, you really f feel honored to spend time with these cats. I do too. It's so nice, especially after a prolonged absence from the area. <laughs> mm. And there's something much more appealing, I find, about a sleeping leopard than there is about a sleeping lion. I know that I'm really pretty biased when it comes to that sort of thing. I love lions when they're on the hunt in the dawn and they're getting around and moving. And, well, not so. We protect and reconnect nature across Southern Africa. We bring countries together to care for wild spaces that stretch beyond borders. We protect and restore biodiversity. We prioritize the people living in these landscapes, enabling them to thrive in harmony with nature. We are restoring tomorrow. Well, my name is Mark Carantonis, and I'm the co-owner of a travel company called Africa Direct and I'm from White River in, in Mpumalanga and I'm the founder of Safari Guide of the Year. It takes a lot of courage, you know, to put your hand up and say I'm in. To put yourself forward and say I'm here to learn, it's not possible without them. <laughs> Very cute. Obviously still a few flies knocking about, despite the <laughs> despite the relative cool of the day. It is starting to cool down quite a lot now. I may have to put on my jacket. Shocking as it may seem. Oh, that's too cute. Right, let's go across to Chris. Uh, apparently we're going to have a demonstration of him um, putting on more layers. I suspect it's getting pretty chilly there at Pridelands. Uh, I have already put a layer on, quite a thick one, because it's definitely dropping in temperature here at Pridelands. We still have a relatively large bank of clouds to our west so I'm not sure if we will be able to have such a glorious sunset like we always do but it will still be good we'll, we'll take a look and see what we can in fact scratch out of the ashes here so we've come back to the calm and the light is starting to fade and we also had quite a bit of wind coming up and the wind is also changing direction all the time. So we decided it's probably a safer option to then rather come back to the vehicle as such. Now I'm just enjoying the colors. listening to the wind. There's a lot of our viewers saying there's nothing like a sunset at Pridelands. Yeah, there's definitely something special about the sunsets around here.
even though we're not going to have such an intense sunset, it's still pretty, isn't it? Johnny Bravo says, <laughs> on there, Johnny Bravo, he says, Chris has done it again with a beautiful sunset. Well, this is about as good I can get you today. Well, let's see, maybe the colors do intensify a little bit later. What I'm hoping is that you might actually see some of the sun's rays sort of protruding from the top of that cloud and why you see it is because of dust and shades created by the shape of the sh of the of the um, of the cloud itself we know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days you are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But as you know, a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work. Because Wild Earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content. But we want to let you know that we hear you. And to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Lacey, who's aged eight, is asking how many taste buds does an elephant have? Lacey, I do really not know. But I do suspect there's plenty. I honestly don't know. I'm going to try and find out. trying to think now if I've ever read something about how many taste buds, taste buds an elephant have and I don't think I've ever read it somewhere. Anyway, I'm going to try and see if I can scan through a few books of mine and let's go over to James who still with La Lumba and the two kids. Lumba is all very well, but I want now cuteness of cubs. I'm becoming very fussy. I suppose that uh, I'm just grateful to see all of them together. It's a very special thing to do and to be able to do. But when I find whenever you're in a sighting like this, what happens is you start to get quite uh, fussy and quite uh, insistent 
on opportunities to see them doing things like interacting or hunting or whatever it is. And that happens the more and more time that you spend with cats like this. When I was in Laikipia with that black leopard, the first photograph I took of it was its backside disappearing through a bush, and I thought, well, you know, if that's all we get, that's all we get. We've seen a black leopard. It's fantastic. And my guest was happy we'd seen the black leopard, and we kind of high-fived each other, and we thought, well, that's cool. Then I got a second view, and we almost got a view of its face, of her face, and she was sort of looking into the bushes. Well, three nights later, we were getting very fussy about full-on frontal face shots, crouching hunting shots. So, you know, one does get a little bit, I suppose, not blasé, but expectant of what nature should provide. And this is a sighting of three magnificent cats, and I should just be grateful for it as it is. It is very special just to be in their presence. We've put our jackets on now as the temperature has begun to plummet. Come here. No, I don't think that she would tolerate Maripse's presence here. Maripse is now... How old is he? He must be... Please excuse me for not remembering this exactly, but he must be pushing two years now, um, at least. And that means that he's, you know, he's he's a problem cat as far as a mother cat, a mother leopard goes. It's unlikely at his age that he would ever do any real... Yeah, so he's just over two years old. It's unlikely that he would do some serious damage to any of these cubs, but she certainly wouldn't tolerate his presence around them. She is related to him. Obviously, they are siblings, but they don't know that they're siblings, and they may smell relatively familiar to each other, but they've spent no time growing up with each other, and she won't tolerate him. So it's interesting, people often say, well, you know, do male lions, male leopards recognize their own offspring? Are they able to recognize or smell their own offspring? And the answer is yes, they can, and generally. And that's because of a, a phenomenon, or it's not really a phenomenon, it's, it's a structure called the major histocompatibility complex, say so that after you've had three scotches. Major histocompatibility complex. And it's a unique kind of marker that occurs in all animals. And the more closely related, basically what it translates to is the more closely related you are to somebody, the more familiar they'll smell. And so, yeah, we do think that male lions and leopards can smell their own offspring. Now, what that means as far as Maripse and Tlalamba goes is that there will be a familiarity for sure, but it won't be particularly close. And I think you'll also find that given that their fathers were different, it will be even further away than it might be. And after that, um, I think what you'll also find is that the fact that they've never spent time with each other would mean that there's a total unfamiliarity and a fear from the mother to have any male leopard around her cubs. There is the female cub <laughs> having a meal. If you'd like to dispute that that's the female cub, I've got no problem with that. for sure leopards definitely get over their playfulness um, you'll seldom see a big male leopard playing at all 
once they hit puberty, they become much less playful, much less confiding. Uh, the late great Hosanna is a wonderful example. You know, as a, as a male cub, he was hugely confiding. You could view him on foot. He would approach you on foot. He'd come round the little the camp at night and, you know, you'd look out your bathroom window in the evening and find him staring up into it. And then as soon as he hit puberty and he moved away, he became like a, an adult male leopard. It wouldn't tolerate people on foot. I mean, he would tolerate them, but he would move away. And I remember he came back to Juma aged, I think, about three. And we used to find him on foot, and he just... He didn't really want to be around us. He'd move away, whereas before he just used to kind of look what we were doing and carry on. And once he hit puberty, he started to move away, and he became much less playful. And that will happen with all these cats. Talamba is... I mean, they do show elements of playfulness as adults. I think the females probably more so, interestingly, than the males. And they definitely get more playful when they've got cubs, and that's possibly why they retain the playfulness, whereas the males don't. I mean, I cannot remember one incident of seeing Tingana, who, for those of you who don't know, was a, a, a firm favourite in these parts, and the male leopard that dominated this area for a long time. I don't remember ever seeing him play at all. Australia now saying we're looking at the male cub, okay? I don't dispute that at all. The one on the termite mound, I didn't see its head. So if we're looking at the male cub now, that could well be true. Thank you for that, Straya. I can't actually see from where I'm sitting. I'm amazed that you can see the spot pattern there. Maybe I need to look at the screen more carefully. I mean, I think that makes it three out of three incorrect identification so far. That's fantastic. I've really done an absolutely sterling job of my leopard identifications. I'm nothing if not consistent. Yes, I think that's possible. The final control is saying to me we may have been be looking at uh, hyenas, not leopards. Yeah, given my form currently... That's not impossible. I stand by the rest of what I've said, though, even though my identification ability is so poor. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwa's Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. I'm still waiting for one of the cubs to come and say hello to her. For the fatty who's having a meal to finally give someone else a turn. I mean, I feel that would be the fairest thing to do. <laughs> Amazon has made the comment, James, zero, viewers, three. Thank you, Amazon. Secret Marsh says, no, no matter, doesn't matter, we found the leopard. Yeah, no, I guess that's true. And like I say, on a, <laughs> on a scale of um, dreadful things being done around the world today, uh, we have worse mistakes.
let's go back across to Liam. He's on Chitwa Chitwa. Uh, perhaps he'll be able to see some leopards or even some lions. So, um, I definitely can understand what uh, James is saying with regards to um, misidentifying certain individuals. It is, uh, <laughs> it is a real mission. Um, but uh, I guess it, um, it comes with more and more time and more and more regular sightings of the local territorial characters. And then it gets easier and easier. So, uh, myself and Pan have now left the Chitwa property uh, had a wonderful look at those hippos and a bit of bird life there. I think uh, slowly but surely we're going to make our way back onto Juma and make a few loops um, at this prime time, see what we can see in terms of nocturnal stuff getting active. There is definitely a nip in the air, it is frosty. It's looking like quite clear skies this evening. There will be no blanket like we had last night. Tomorrow morning is going to be cold. tough out here in Africa <laughs> and um, we've all got lots of beanies coffee flasks to go that makes it quite bearable Here at Wild Earth, we promised great monthly prizes for our explorers, and this month is no exception. If you join our club before the 10th of July, then you stand a chance to win a fabulous Safari Guide online course brought to you by Bushwise Field Guides. They specialize in accredited Safari Guide training with courses tailored for the African Safari Lodge industry. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer today and don't miss out on this life-changing opportunity. And coming up in first place and officially named Mbilo is Hearts Cup. Short, no. So uh, a hippo bull will allow his son to stay up until the point where that young bull hits puberty. As soon as um, testosterone starts to show up in that young male's dung and um, that young male's urine, uh, the big dominant bull will almost certainly uh, scent those hormones. He'll be able to smell them. And um, with that younger male starting to become a threat, the older bull will uh, inevitably start to try and push his youngster out. It can be a brutal time for young male hippos though. Often a young male that is reluctant to leave home um, is left with a back that looks like it's been slashed with a whip. It looks horrible. Hundreds of open sores full of ox peckers, um, lots of flies, very raw, very painful. Um, and if, um, if that young male, that uh, young bull, his son, doesn't really get the message and doesn't get moving, um, he may very well end up losing his life. A bit bizarre that uh, father would kill his own son, but um, ultimately he's got to protect his breeding rights, his territory, and that young male uh, presents a threat. Yeah, life as a hippo is brutal. It's not an easy, an easy existence at all. 
We spend so much time watching them just sort of snoozing during the day, all resting their chins on each other. Looks like a life of luxury, but um, oh, it's not. It's a very, very volatile existence. But yeah, thanks for your question, a great one. question you've asked about the depth of water um, that a hippo kind of requires to live in so I would say prime depth is probably about a, a meter and a half maybe five five and a half feet something like that so hippos don't really float um, ideally water should be just deep enough to submerge them as they stand and give them the ability to rest in the shallower sections during the day with their bellies on the bottom and their chin kind of resting on uh, on the back of a neighbor. Anything much deeper than that is too deep for hippos. Um, if hippos are seen in deep water like that, it's only just passing through, running along the bottom. And obviously if water is then too shallow and the hippo spends the most of uh, the majority of the day with its back exposed, it's um, setting itself up for some serious sun damage. Uh, once the um, sort of safety blanket of that skin is uh, seriously enough damaged, infection gets in there, that hippo could probably die. So yeah, I'd say about a meter, meter and a half of water, that's pretty, pretty ideal. Enough. that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days you are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert but we want to let you know that we hear you you can watch wild earth without the ads sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the wild earth head over to our explorer page to find out more I think we're going to soak up the scene a little bit here at uh, Treehouse Dam. This has been such a prolific spot in the past uh, with incredible sightings at this time of day. I think uh, in the meantime, though, I believe Tlalumbo and Cubs may be up and mobile, so I think it is probably a prime moment to uh, join James on his drive. Are now moving. That's the young female cub on the Lumber is now at the kill. The male has moved away from the kill. And that's the best view we have currently. The male with his enormously fat belly has wandered off to the other side. And mum is now having a go at the kill. And it was amazing to watch because as soon as he left the kill, she got up and moved. It took literally less than 10 seconds. He is just the other side of one of the vehicles here. Here comes the female cub. She's coming down now.
Nice to see. A little thing coming through. Please don't lie there. Please don't lie there, I beg you. Come out into the open and clean yourself where your mother was lying. I'm going to give her precisely 30 seconds before I move the vehicle back slightly. We are losing light. There we go. She's going to move a little bit now. Hi, little one. she goes to where her mother is. Mm. Looks like she's going to climb into the vehicle next to us. Can you hear some hyenas in the distance? Whoop. Smelling where mum's been and maybe where her brother's been. Hmm, Joseph, the answer is when they're not cubs anymore. So they won't scent Mark until they're almost, or well, until they are independent, pretty much. Then, then they kind of start what looks like scent marking. So the males especially will start to demonstrate territorial behavior, but they don't call seriously. And they don't call at all until they really are ready to try and take over a territory. So you wouldn't expect them to start doing any scent marking until they're much older. Well, I mean, they may start a little bit while they're with their mother, but I don't think so. There's Tlalampa. The two cubs have now gone behind a vehicle. So we're just going to keep looking at Tlalampa for now. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. They've been looking down towards the south quite consistently throughout the afternoon and I'm interested in whether or not there is perhaps another predator coming here. Um, we're going to move slightly because the other two cubs, I think, I think the cubs, the other two cubs, the cubs are out in the open-ish and there's a vehicle between us and them. moving the kill. Hang on a sec. She's moving the kill now. Sorry. Let's see where she takes it. Other than into some more thick bush. I think that leafless marula tree just up behind would be a great idea. That one. Okay, let me move again. She's moving it. She's taking it. The 
There's still quite a lot of meat left. Oh, we're just going to try and stash that. There is a kind of spiky tree in front of her. And here comes one of the cubs from the other side, following mum. She's immediately aware of that. It's amazing how they, good their hearing is. There he, she comes. Not prepared to say who I think that is. Not at this stage, anyway. Columbus now moving with the kill. And it's a really spiky, nasty tree that she's found. Little one's now in front of us, pawing at something that's on the ground there, another little bit of kill. Something else left there. Something delicious. straight to that really unpleasant looking spiky tree. It's an Eliodendron transvalensis or transvale saffron tree. No thorns, but it is very dense and thick. I think maybe let's try and get in there. What do you think, Kharaj? Let's maybe try and get a view of her and see if she's going to try and hoist up in there. Let's try and not drive into a large hole. Uh, doing so, I think we're going to go straight up here. So you find it really impressive how the cubs have already got personalities. There, oh, she's up the tree already. It, it is very impressive and it's, it happens almost immediately. You can see it. Long before now. There we go, that's quite a shot. <laughs> of what used to be a Nyala and is now really the remnants of a Nyala. Let's have a quick look there and then I'm going to move around the other side, see if we can get a look at her face. Not sure how much higher she's going to go in this tree, but not an awful choice of tree, I don't think. Okay, let's go a little way around. It's not far. Should be able to get a nice view here. And this is the great thing about most Sarpy Sands leopards, is that they're totally tolerant of us just moving around them. She started to move it again. You're right there. <laughs> I planted Gerrit in a tree. All right, I think we're going to move again because we've just got a butt shot. Which is never the best shot. Naturally, she's moving. <laughs> oh, this is a deep irritation. <laughs> she's moving as we, as we got into position there. <laughs> oh, my luck. She's now... If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. 
Here at Wild Earth, we promised great monthly prizes for our explorers, and this month is no exception. If you join our club before the 10th of July, then you stand a chance to win a fabulous Safari Guide online course brought to you by Bushwise Field Guides. They specialize in accredited safari guide training with courses tailored for the African safari lodge industry. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer today and don't miss out on this life-changing opportunity. And I think the little ones are coming, so we might be lucky to see them all in the tree. <laughs> so you could imagine walking past here, and you wouldn't see a thing until the leopard either dropped out of the tree or growled at you. That's a superb shot of Tlalamba's rear end. Thank you, Tlalamba, for that. Beautiful picture. <laughs> Quite stunning, in fact. Chris has discovered something quite phenomenal from the physics perspective. Let's go over to him and find out what it is. Well, it's not uh, that phenomenal. What is phenomenal is the amount of impala on this plane. It's called impala plane. For that reason, at night, several different herds will come into this area. And I've counted now one, two, three, four, five, six different herds. You won't be able to see them all. We won't be able to zoom into all of them. It's quite a large plane. And that's all for safety. There's less things for predators to hide behind. You can actually see each individual herd associating, you know. There's a couple of youngsters that were starting as well, which was quite hilarious. But we couldn't get them in time. All right, well. I think we are losing light quite quickly now, so let's rather head over back to James to see what's up with La Lumba and the Cubs. No, no action here, I'm afraid. She's come down the tree and she's on her way, I think, to fetch the Cubs. So she was sitting in the tree going... Was a shop called Chuffing, and she was chuffing at the little ones, and I thought they were going to come this way. And I just don't want to get between the tree and the cubs and the mother. So let's just reverse back this way and see if we can sensitively view them. We're shortly going to go into in infrared. Now we can see one down there, still eating. I'm not sure if the diker is there as well. Let me just, I'm going to plonk myself into this gap here. Let's have a look. Very good workout driving these cars. No, I think they've moved now. I can't see any leopard cat under there. Oh, there they are. They're going off towards the other side. We'll move again. Oh, I'm being attacked by bushes. Very unreasonable of them. Ah, oh, look, there's a cub. Cub about to climb a tree. <laughs> Just 
leveling up. There we go. So the little cub's gone to the tree, the mother's left. There we go. Up you go. That's cool. Now I suspect, and I could be wrong, let's face it, I have a record of being wrong. This could be the female who's now going to have a bit of a bite to eat. Up it goes. Very cool. I've got a bit of a belly, so maybe it's the fat male. I'll try and move now. There we go. Just try and get in there. Obstacle course of sticks here. Stickical course. <laughs> oh, there goes the lumber towards the tree. And coming up in first place, an officially named Bilo. Is Hans Cub. We protect and reconnect nature across southern Africa. We bring countries together to care for wild spaces that stretch beyond borders. We protect and restore biodiversity. We prioritize the people living in these landscapes, enabling them to thrive in harmony with nature. We are restoring tomorrow. A little hyena behind us, because, and that's exactly why she's pulled the kill up a tree. just precisely for this eventuality. And the hyena will now get nothing. The other cub, wherever it is, is entirely able to escape from a hyena. There's no difficulty with that. So that is the female, right, is it? Yes, one, two, three, four, five. That's Tlalamba. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, I got it right, it is a female. I haven't had a good look at the one in the tree. Those of you who are on YouTube can rewind and have a look. The one coming down. Come on. Now having a scratch. Hiding its, <laughs> hiding its face behind the only bush in the way, naturally. Oh, look at that, isn't that gorgeous? No, white man, these cubs have stopped suckling some time back. They'll wean completely by around four months. I mean, sometimes they'll try and suckle for a bit longer than that, but they can survive without milk from sort of three or four months. Mum's gone up, youngster's coming down. You can see sh showing zero fear for any hyena that might be in the area. That's very nice, actually. We can see mum. I can hear bones crunching behind us. That's definitely the hyena, not the leopard. Having a go at the bones. 
That is the female cub. It's got a five-five spot pattern like its mum. Hada. Hi. Nice to meet you. Finally. I thought I'd met you a while back, but I hadn't. Cool. Okay, so we've got the two girls here. I'm not sure where Boyo's gone. Yes, sorry, I mean, it's exactly the same as, I suppose, any mammal that eventually goes independent or becomes independent from its parents. Oh, there's the male. He's straight ahead of us there. <laughs> He's on that tree. There we are. It's not much of a tree, but he's on a tree. I could possibly... No, that's quite a nice shot. Let's just leave it there. Columbus down and running. And I think it's because she knows there's other meat around and she can hear it being eaten. She's running off. Sorry, Solly, I will get back to your comment. We're not going to try and follow Tlalumba. She's disappeared down into the little drainage line behind us. Cubs are staying behind, watching carefully. And I think what's going on here... Ah, here comes the male cub. Now they're following her. Oh, here comes the little male. Is he going to go up the tree or follow his sister? Some rustling in the grasses. Male standing now below the tree. Columba gone behind us. All right, so Solly, yes, it is interesting to watch how independent they are, yet dependent. But if you think about a teenage child, here comes the hyenas and the leopards are up the tree. Don't be nasty. Go collect what you can off the ground and leave the leopards be. There we go, he's scuttled off. Sufficient chase. Let's get back to your question now. It's just like with human beings. You think of a teenage human being is. The chuff chuffing? Right at five kilometers. It's like a great white shark, you know. So the uh, nocturnal chapter of this evening's game drive has begun. Um, our infrared is set up on the camera and we are shining spotlights left and right in the hopes of picking out some nocturnal life on this evening's drive. My goodness, it has been action-packed for James and Gert this afternoon. Uh, we are very happy for that. I know James was extremely eager to uh, touch base with his old friend Tlalamba. And, uh, and he's done that in a big way today. Phenomenal. It has been a predator, a predator Monday. My name is Mark Carantonis and I'm the co-owner of a travel company called Africa Direct and I'm from White River in, in Mpumalanga and I'm the founder of Safari Guide of the Year. It takes a lot of courage, you know, to put your hand up and say I'm in, to put yourself forward and say I'm here to learn. It's not possible without them. My name is Michelle Duplessis and I'm the Managing Director of the Field Guides Association of Southern Africa. 
I'm one of the judges this year and I'll be judging the game drive category as well as hospitality, professionalism and storytelling. I really look forward to seeing everybody again this year and obviously to meet the incredible contestants. Yeah, this can be a bit of a tricky time of year to see things like um, like snakes, chameleons, etc. in the evenings. Uh, with it being so cool, uh, our reptilian residents are not uh, not so visible. Also, not really likely to see things like uh, the scorpions on the road or um, anything like that, really. But uh, stranger things have happened. And obviously there is still lots of other life out there, things like African wildcats, genet, civet, perhaps the odd whisper of a serval or a caracal. Who knows what we might find. So uh, I think James's signal has improved somewhat this evening. Uh, let's check back in with him and see what's happening in that very exciting sighting of Talamba and Cubs. I'm afraid we have been let down very badly by Rusty. There are four leopards in the sighting now. Mulwati, the male, came in. He jumped up the tree. He has now taken the kill. It was amazing to watch. He came in just as the signal cut, I'm afraid. He's now dropped a piece onto the ground. The hyena seems to have disappeared. And now, up in that kind of mess of branches, there is a big male leopard the father of these cubs. The cubs were chuffing at him and he just went up there and decided to have a meal. It's amazing and I suppose very like the experience I've just had in East Africa where the male here is totally comfortable at night even with a spotlight on him. You can see that's not our spotlight and completely unwilling to be around a vehicle in the day. Now I'm afraid we can't move because we seem to lose signal as soon as we move positions from where we are now. We've got a youngster in straight in front of us. There we go. Just watching up into the tree, imagining another meal. <laughs> really, this has been an insanely magnificent sighting for us. I'm just sad it's happened all at night, and sadly why we didn't have any, any signal. Anyway, so it goes. Now that Roan, the hyena seems to have absconded. I don't know where the hyena's gone or why it is not still hanging around, but it seems to have gone. I think also, I don't know where the diker was, and I wonder if the hyena didn't find the diker in the bush down below there, and perhaps he's taken off the diker and that's what he's eating. Because this is the nyala, the original kill that's in the tree there. Fantastic, fantastic sighting out that leg's about to fall on the ground and with any luck the others will come and take it when it drops. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert.
But as you know, a life without advertising would mean a very boring evening when you arrive home from work. Because Wild Earth and most other media companies rely on advertising in order to fund our content. But we want to let you know that we hear you. And to show you how much we care about your experience in nature, you can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. I suppose what's typical here is that the male has stolen everything from the female and the cubs. And, you know, it goes back to what we were talking about this week as a kind of focus on dads in the wild. And this is what dads in the wild tend to do in the cat world, certainly, and especially in the leopard world. He's come in here and he has decided to scavenge the food from his offspring and from his wife, basically, one of his wives, and they will not be allowed to share until he has had his fill. There goes the leg. There we go. Oh dear, here comes the hyena. Hyena's running. Now there are two leopards in the tree. Now, this is fascinating. The hyena is now making off with the leg. And what happened was that I think as Tlalamba went up the tree, Mulwati then hissed at her, didn't want her up in the tree with him, so she got a fright and dropped the leg. The hyena took the leg. The hyena's gone off with the leg, and the two cubs have gone off behind us. <sighs> Unbelievable stuff. And you can hear the cracking of that leg bone in the distance now as the hyena's powerful jaws cut through it. Sheepers. What a sighting. What a sighting. And there's still chuffing going on. to the growling. Listen. Can you hear that? There's a leopard chuffing at the bottom. I think it's Tlalamba chuffing up towards Morwati and Morwati's growling at her. He sounds like this. Apparently you can't hear it. He's doing this. He's chewing and panting. Now, what Gerrit and I think has happened is that this leopard was quite close by, where those Franklins were alarm calling earlier today. And we drove straight in there, and because he's Mulwati and refuses to be seen in the day, he probably just disappeared. And then when he heard the hyena come in here, and the chafafal that took place when the hyena got here, he came running through to see what was going on, and in typical male leopard style, has now scavenged a meal from his wife and two children. Remember, his role as a male is to protect the kids, basically, from other male leopards. That's his parenting role. His presence ensures their survival, even if he never interacts with them and even if he steals their food. I suppose you could describe this kind of theft as part of Tlalumba's trophic budget. Oh, dropped another little piece. 
the lumber's moving to take it. Just down below there. I think that's the lumber. Yeah, I think so. The two cubs have gone off behind us. She's a little bit braver around the hyena and the male. So by trophic budget, I just mean that, you know, she can kill enough to compensate for any kind of scavenging. I think the, le the hyena's come in now. It's making its way into the sighting. Having consumed the leg that was dropped. Brazen, brazen scavenger. Leave it alone. And off it goes for a second helping. Yuck. Dripping with blood, that was. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. It's obviously very tiring for him to steal like this. Another leg bone passing through the gullet of a hyena in the background. Crunch, crunch, smash. Oh, very interesting. Okay, we're not going to move from here. We're going to wait and see what, how this plays out. You're going to go across to Liam, who has found a herd of Africa's wild cattle. So speaking of incredible sounds, we've just bumped into a huge herd of buffalo, probably a hundred plus individuals, moving through the bush just here on Zoe's Road. What a wonderful surprise to cap off uh, this lovely afternoon. And again, just talking about incredible sounds, I'm going to stop talking for uh, just a, a little while. You can hear the sound of this tremendous herd of uh, big bovines moving through. So we are totally surrounded by buffalo on all sides. I estimated about 100, but uh, potentially even more than that. Um, I have seen a herd in the Greater Kruger of a thousand plus, a thousand plus individuals. I'm hearing from uh, Jarrett in our master control that uh, the sound is coming through quite well. That's good to hear. Uh, the sound of. Uh, Hundreds of hoofbeats in the dark. It's really special. And again, we are filming now in infrared. So this is light that the buffalo cannot see at all. As far as they're concerned, it's pretty much pitch dark. That's um, 
pretty ideal. No disturbance of their behavior, and if a lion was to pitch up here, it wouldn't put the buffalo at any disadvantage. With large herds of buffalo, you often get prides of lion following suit. Um, so I wonder if in the next day or two, we may get, uh, get some nice lion sightings. Fingers crossed. My goodness, it is great to be back in the Sabi Sands, right in the thick of it. Here at Wild Earth, we promised great monthly prizes for our explorers, and this month is no exception. If you join our club before the 10th of July, then you stand a chance to win a fabulous Safari Guide online course brought to you by Bushwise Field Guides. They specialize in accredited Safari Guide training with courses tailored for the African Safari Lodge industry. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer today and don't miss out on this life-changing opportunity. And coming up in first place, an officially named Mbilo is Hot's Cub. that for a contrast now almost total silence from all of those thundering hooves and uh, moos and grunts from the buffalo I suppose there's probably still a few there in the background but uh, peace reigns supreme once more well hopefully these buffalo are now uh, moving quite steadily through our property are still around tomorrow but I think we're going to link back or head back over to James to see what's happening uh, with these leopards he is possibly hoping also that they'll be closely followed by oh listen oh, what he's growling he's coming down the tree by lions is what I meant to say Followed closely by lions, talking about the buffalo. Now we're back to the leopard sighting. So see how this plays out? He's already got a fat belly, which means he's already been eating. Big fat belly. I do apologize for the picture. The tree is in the way, and also I can't move. On account of the fact that we lose signal in this area. Michael Fleetwood wondering if I heard of or saw the sighting of the five leopards, which was these four and Tundi from a few months ago. I did not see that. Uh, I did hear about it though, Michael. Fascinating, fascinating sighting. And Gerrit was retelling me about it just now. There he comes down the tree. a nice view of him. The ghost of Chuma. He's still growling. And there's no way that fat belly was from what he's eaten now. Rather like his predecessor, he appears to be a very good scavenger. I don't know where he's going now. I'm not going to move because I'm afraid we will lose signal. So let's just wait and see if Tandy doesn't come back and see if she can reclaim her kill. He's marking territory. I can hear him scraping in the background. The cubs are behind us. Many of you concerned that they won't have made it up a tree or that they are unsafe. They're fine. They're used to this. Listen to him. 
They know how to deal with this. They've seen many hyenas in their time. I think he's looking, he's with one of the cubs there. I'm gonna have to try and move everyone because I think this will be really cool. Yeah, he's with the cubs. He's just walked past one of them. Okay, let me try and move. spotlight to make sure that I don't get in anyone's way or hit anyone. I'm not going to shine on the, the leopards once I spot one. There's one there, right there. I'm going to stop here. I'll turn on the infrared again. He's just in the middle of the light there. I think more white has gone off towards the right hand side. I can't see who that is. There's a growling. He's marking his territory. There's chuffing. Look at the chuffing, they're all coming together, I think. Naturally behind the bush. Left a bit, left a bit. I think that's the big male. There we go, there he is. Is that the male? No, that's not the male. That's mum. Kalama's by the tree. Yeah, Kalama's at the tree. Oh, that is the male. Oh, it is, yes, look at that, fantastic. Kalama's next to the tree now. Gosh, it's very difficult to tell what on earth's going on here. So very cool, very, very cool to see the little cub approach dad. And actually, Dad seems a bit more tolerant than his predecessor, Tingana, who used to show his teeth. But had exactly the same approach. Wowee. Yeah, Joe, Mawat, he's a, a male leopard. He's a good-sized male leopard. I don't think he's outlandishly big. I think he's pretty much the same size as Tingana was in his prime. They definitely start to lose weight as they get older. He's in his prime and he looks pretty good. Do you think I dare move or should we wait here for a little while? Uh, approaching. Him? Oh. Okay, the cub's coming this way, so I think we're just gonna wait here. Tracking is very good. What is the starting tracking? Just track the leopard. You walk a little bit, you stop. You keep starting checking. Keep your hands, your neck up, okay, your eyes. Listen for the birds. You follow the leopard. The leopard should see you first. You lose. Talk next year. Uh, my name is Juan Pinto. I'm here for Safari Guard of the Year. I'm one of the judges. One of the categories in the competition is the walk or the on-foot experience, as you call it. And it's kind of the leveler. It's the experience that really, really is important for a guide to have to be able to take people safely into the environment on a walk. tough. Sorry about the dark screen. We're just trying to move a bit and then we'll turn on the infrared light and you'll have a good view. There they are. Let's move slightly forward again. There we go. We will get a view. It's just very tricky to organize everything in the dark, turn on the infrared, sort out what's happening. One of them's gone up, another one at the base. <laughs> I 
Yes, they're both there. Unbelievable. There's a little growling of Mawati behind us. So that's the male cub. I'm getting it now, you see? 3-3 three, three male cub. He does look slightly stockier than his sister. Endo, I think the sighting is better than Liam's. Um, no, I don't think it is better than Liam's. I think Liam saw a kill in the day. Uh, I think that's pretty unbelievable. Up they go. The hyenas come in. <laughs> unbelievable again. Incredible how they knew exactly what was happening. Just in case anyone's concerned, we are not shining a spotlight. So I, I'm not sure what the rules are anymore in this part of the world, but we are not shining a spotlight on the situation. We are putting only infrared light, which is invisible completely to the animals. Exciting to say the least, I think incredible. We are so happy that uh, Kat and James um, have had such a nice afternoon. Uh, we ourselves cannot complain either. We've had a phenomenal time out on drive. Yeah, you just never know what is around the next corner. Um, and especially uh, for James and Kat this evening after all of the chatter about Father's Day and um, our focus on dads this week. Uh, to have that uh, priceless interaction between Malwati and the Cubs this evening, that is just exquisite. It puts the cherry on the top of uh, the leopard viewing that we've experienced today. Absolutely unreal. Yeah, and that's the, uh, the Sabi Sand Game Reserve in a nutshell. Um, it is arguably the best place on the planet to view leopard in the wild. Unparalleled interaction, dynamics, and uh, behavior from animals that are quite relaxed over the whole. I've been 
fortunate to be working in the guiding industry for about 26 years now. I've also been fortunate enough to do nine years of the 10 years um, as one of the judges and the particular components that I do is the walking and the shooting exercises. If you're the winner, if you're going to be the winner, it's important to become an ambassador for the field guide industry and competitors in the future. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwa's Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. The search goes on for uh, nocturnal life in any other form this evening as well. I mentioned we were hopeful uh, we may get some lions coming through. Uh, Vicky, um, thanks for your question. You've asked with regards to um, buffalo herds and um, the kind of level of destruction they leave behind when they move through. Look, certainly um, a herd of a couple of hundred, potentially even one or two thousand buffalo is consuming a lot of vegetation and um, especially with the hundreds upon hundreds of heavy hoof beats uh, pounding much of the grass that is on the ground um, into, into just dust. So uh, certainly buffalo don't really break trees in the same way that elephants do and um, sort of just mountains of uh, wanton destruction for lack of a better word uh, but um, huge numbers of buffalo will put an enormous pressure on uh, especially the grazing value of an area um, often uh, causing erosion in some areas especially if the buffalo don't have the luxury of uh, moving out of an area into a greater system in search of fresh grass. So yeah, an overloaded buffalo population can do damage. Everything in moderation. Uh, that's the beauty of this area. If we have too many buffalo, um, the herds are forced to move deeper into the Kruger and our lions and hyenas do a great job of keeping the weaker ones under control. Yeah, thanks uh, for that question, Vicky. That was a great one. Yeah, so hopeful that um, we might get a pride of lions uh, popping in behind those buff uh, buffalo that have uh, crossed into Juma from Biffle's Hook. Uh, who knows, maybe the, the lions that we know are somewhere a little bit further southeast of us, may be attracted by uh, the sound of all of those thundering hooves this evening. Fingers crossed. Of course, we've also got wild dogs in the area, my goodness. So um, tomorrow promises to be a day full of possibility. Obviously, no guarantees of anything. Have to keep that nice open mind out on drive, but um, mountains of possibility. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. 
Here at Wild Earth, we promised great monthly prizes for our explorers, and this month is no exception. If you join our club before the 10th of July, then you stand a chance to win a fabulous Safari Guide online course brought to you by Bushwise Field Guides. They specialize in accredited Safari Guide training with courses tailored for the African Safari Lodge industry. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer today and don't miss out on this life-changing opportunity. Any normal circumstances, no. So uh, buffalo are a little bit too big for uh, a wild dog to take on. And uh, buffalo calves are usually just too well defended by uh, very, very aggressive buffalo herds uh, to be picked off by the dogs on the outskirts. Uh, dogs just don't have the, the physical strength of something like a lion to wrestle um, a buffalo down. But in that same breath, um, I have personal experience of um, drought conditions in the Sabi Sand 2016-2017 where many of our buffalo were extremely worn down, um, very weak, very tired, most of them perishing to starvation. Um, during that time we've uh, viewed um, on at least two occasions uh, buffalo being killed by wild dogs, adult buffalo females. Honestly, not really even uh, killed in the, the normal wild dog sense, basically just, just eaten alive. Uh, so, uh, so pretty horrifying, but it proves that um, there's always sort of an exception to the rule in nature. Wild animals don't read textbooks. <laughs> But yeah, under any normal circumstances, a buffalo is just too big, too big and too dangerous for wild dogs. Um, I've even on a number of occasions seen wild dogs chasing white rhino, but um, obviously uh, I, th I think that's more, more fun and games to be honest. Um, more just for the hell of it rather than to actually try and kill and eat a rhino. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think we're going to cross back over to James to see how his bumble is going after all of that excitement uh, with that tree full of leopards. It's uh, bumbling. It's bumbling along. We're slowly making our way back to camp. Uh, wonderful sighting we had there. We thoroughly enjoyed it. And again, so heartening to see the little interaction there between leopard daddy and leopard cub. Even if I do have a fairly dim view of Morwati, uh, simply because he is so unconfiding in daylight when I could take pictures of him. I think I've got two pictures of Morwati. One of them when he had a warthog between his teeth and I, the other one, he was way in the distance. And we got a long range view of him. Anyway, he's sired two beautiful little cubs who thankfully have not taken after him in regard to their, their regard to humans. So that's wonderful. Beautiful sighting, wonderful afternoon, and obviously very different, the morning and the evening sightings. The morning of the kill, the evening the massive interaction. Very special. Who knows what tomorrow holds? I'm sure it will be wonderful. And coming up in first place and officially named Bilo is Hot's Cub.
and my profound thanks for your patience with my inability to identify the leopards this morning. <laughs> no, Wayne, leopard siblings do not help each other out in adulthood. Once they are truly adults, they won't have anything to do with each other except to mate with each other if they're male and female. Uh, if they happen to, if the male happens to take over the territory that his father held and his sister li still lives in the territory, then they will mate when she comes into estrus. It's perfectly normal, it's perfectly fine for three or four generations and the cats, as we've discussed many times. But other than that, they won't interact with each other. Normally, of course, when they're adults, the male will move away and he will never see his sister again, or is unlikely to see his sister again. And if they're two females, they'll often set up territories next to each other, and then they will become enemies. They don't have nice, friendly, truffy little interactions on their boundaries. And I will never forget the sighting we had of Tandi, uh, erstwhile queen of Juma, and her daughter Kuchava meeting on Tandi's southern boundary, Kuchava's northern boundary, and they had an absolutely rip-snorting fight. Tandi was ma the main aggressor, but Kuchava wasn't too far behind, and they had wanted nothing to do with each other. In fact, they seemed to detest each other, rather. So no, they don't really interact. And again, it's one of those things we look for, because in human beings it's something that we think is so valuable about us. And so we look for it in animals. Siblings, one of the most special relationships, human relationships there is, is the relationship between siblings and the help and aid that they give to each other. But it doesn't happen with leopards. Absolutely happens with elephants. Absolutely happens with lionesses and, in, and lions. Lion brothers will live together. Not between lion brothers and sisters, because same thing really, they'll mate with each other unless the males move off. Um, what else? Baboons, dogs the same, yeah, wild dogs. Their siblings will look after each other, same sex siblings, they disperse in same sex groups. So that's quite fun. Baboons the same, I think, yeah, baboons the same, certainly the females. Sisters tend to have stronger bonds than brothers, if I was to look at mammals as a whole, or social mammals as a whole. Mongoose, dwarf mongoose, banded mongoose, same thing. Same as dogs, wild dogs. Hyenas siblings. Yeah, hyena siblings don't really have a very strong bond. Uh, they can often, especially if they're quite high ranking, they can be in very stiff competition. Now, hyena clans are fascinating things because they, spotted hyena clans that is, they are dependent on each other to look after their territories, but unlike lions, they don't demonstrate as adults the same kind of affection and need to reaffirm social bonds. And of course there's a strong hierarchy in hyena females that, do, that doesn't exist amongst lion females. And so there's much less sibling affection amongst hyenas than there is amongst lions. And that's not to cast any aspersions on the hyenas, mind. Oh, interesting question, that. We've discussed so much about dad bonds and mum bonds, but not so much about sibling bonds. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But we want to let you know that we hear you. You can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad free. Head over to our explorer page to find out more.
I think the other interesting bond to discuss, maybe, is that of step-siblings, and does it occur in nature? Do we find step-siblings? And the answer is yes, we do. Uh, often they're cousins, but they certainly would be considered step-siblings. If you think about elephants, where if there's an orphaned elephant, the elephant will be adopted, could be by a total stranger, and that will... <laughs> <laughs> There's a little gerbil here. Can you see it there? There it goes. There it is. No, it's gone. It's a little bush. There it is. Let's see if it jumps again. Little bush felt gerbil, I think. It's moving somewhere in the grass there. There it is, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Shame. Imagine being a little gerbil out here. It must be absolutely terrifying. <laughs> anyway, elephants do adopt orphans, and those orphans then develop a bond with their step-siblings, which I think is very cool. Okay, that's the end of my discussion on that. We can go across to Liam. I can see his lights coming down the road there. Let's see if he's going to spot anything before he spots me. So um, we've just stopped at uh, one of the junctions uh, here on the concession, just to have a bit of a listen out for any signs of nocturnal life, any movement, any alarm calls. We are approaching, uh, quite swiftly approaching, the end of our, uh, our wonderful show this afternoon. I apologize for the slightly funny light um, on my face. Uh, we've had <laughs> some slight technical difficulties, but uh, we should have that uh, figured out by tomorrow, I'm sure. But yeah, from all of us here at uh, Wild Earth, live from the Sabi Sands, uh, thank you so much for tuning in uh, once again. And um, yeah, kind of jumping on board for a yet another epic adventure um, out on drive with us. And we hope you are motivated enough to join us out on drive tomorrow morning again. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, uh, we will all be there. So uh, yeah, from all of us here, good night, um, all the best, and uh, hopefully see you soon.